All right, folks, if you are here for the 315 policy session, we are about to begin. Um, I just want to thank everybody for your patience. Today, we've been running a little bit behind with the tech shifts, but I think part of um, rehumanizing the educational process is to know that things are not always on the timeline we think. So, I used to teach middle school, which has taught me that if you just keep talking in a room of adults, they will eventually stop talking and sit down and listen. That does not work so much with um, middle schoolers, but it does work with teacher educators fairly well. So I'm gonna invite you, if you still have a conversation to have, that is welcome, but you just wanna move it to outside or another room and, um, please feel free to have those conversations, but we are gonna move forward with the policy conversation in this room. So um, before I introduce our policy um, committee co-chairs, oh, see, this is taking longer than it, than it usually takes. And I think it's because Jeff's talk was so good and you're all still probably reeling from that, but we really are gonna start the policy session in a second. And I know you'll all be quiet once Mary gets up here because she's, Fancy. All right. So, um, okay. But before that, just a quick announcement. Um, somebody used the women's restroom and they left their iPhone. And if you, if that was you and you all of a sudden realized you don't have your lifeline, um, uh, Monica has it in the reception area. So if you're missing your iPhone, she has it. Um, okay. And now it gives me, um, Great pleasure and honor to introduce our um, three policy co-chairs, uh, Cynthia Gritzik, Pia Wong, and Nicole Howard, who will then introduce our policy um, guests today. So thank you all so much. Hello, I think I was um, pushed up here to be, to represent all three of, um, the policy co-chairs, uh, Pia Wong. So happy to work with um, Nicole Howard from University of Redlands and Cynthia Gritzik from San Francisco State. And um, before we do the introductions, I just wanna say, let's give it up one more time. I know he's left, but let's give it up for um, the, the conference co-chairs for that really amazing keynote address. And it really seemed like, um, that was a teacher educator speaking to us as, um, as a peer, uh, giving us some challenges to think about, but also giving us some props for the work that we're already doing. So I think feel good about your foundation, but then take all of the very, very important information that he gave to heart and let's start implementing some of those things. Um, so without further ado, uh, this is policy session number one of two. The second one will be tomorrow at 3.15 to 4.15, I believe. I'm looking at Cindy. No, anyway, we'll, we'll clarify that. Um, but today, the policy session is gonna go until 4.30. We're gonna give our policy guests a full hour because um, I think they prepare really important content for us. And um, today we'll be hearing from the CTC, lots and lots of important things for us to be paying attention to. And tomorrow it'll be more of a preparation for our spring policy action network uh, meeting, um, March 13th, 2023 in Sacramento. So with, uh, the second policy session tomorrow is from three to four. So without further ado, I'm happy to introduce David DeGeer, who is the Director of the Professional Services Division of the Commission on Teacher Credentialing. David. Thank you, Pia. Um, on my screen, it looks like Texas has invaded here too. <laughs> so I'm gonna see if we can get rid of them. No. Bye, Texas. All right. Um, I really should have added on this slide that we've got some additional partners. It's not just from the commission today, but I'll be introducing those additional partners later. So uh, there's three topics that we wanna cover first. 
uh, reading and literacy, ethnic studies, and grants. And then we've got a panel that's going to use most of the time today to talk about the new PK3 Early Childhood Education Specialist Instruction Credential and looking forward. So reading and literacy, uh, I hope, I hope, 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 every one of you have heard about Senate Bill 488. It is a very prescriptive bill as to what the commission has to do, uh, which then means you have to do things. Uh, so last week, the commission approved agenda item 4A, which were adoption of new standards and performance expectations in reading and literacy. And that's for the multiple subject, single subject, education specialist, MMSN and ESN. And uh, as we had said at our early, our morning session, the VI, DHH, and ECSE are coming soon. We need a little bit more work on those. So there's a new standard seven on effective literacy instruction for all students. It is very comprehensive. It is based on so many documents, including the state's uh, ELA, ELD frameworks, the uh, dyslexia guidebook, but it's really about best practices in reading instruction. So the TPE Domain 7, again, is about effective literacy instruction. And the new standards include a focus on foundational skills as required by SB 488. We went beyond what was specifically required regarding um, these foundational skills and really looked at the ELD, ELA ELD framework and, and brought in a comprehensive view of literacy. Uh, we worked with a panel of experts and we vetted these standards and TPEs numerous times uh, over the past six months. These will replace the current literacy TPEs on July 1st, 2024. Okay, July 1st, 2024. We kind of didn't exactly follow the timeline in SB 488 because we wanted to get all of the changes, all of the new standards and TPEs to you as soon as possible so that you have almost two years to implement them. So you can see these are the, the many sources um, that, that we use to develop the standards and TPEs and some key dates for you. And we're gonna be sharing this presentation, so uh, don't worry, you will get a copy of it. So our next step is to start developing and implementing technical assistance for preparation programs. Now we can help you on the, you know, how to implement the, stand, uh, not exactly how to implement the standards, but the accreditation part. But we are by no means uh, the experts on reading and literacy instruction. Many of you are. So uh, I've started working with Kimberly White Smith from AICCU and Anna Marie. Um, Francois, thank you. I'm sorry, Anna Marie um, from UC System, Shireen Padre from CSU. And we're going to be looking at how we can use the resources that we have in our three segments already to support all three segments. We need to be working together on this because it's gonna require a lot of faculty professional development. So in winter, we're gonna begin uh, teamwork on the, the design teamwork on the literacy performance assessment. We're gonna have adoption of standards for the low incidence uh, education specialist areas. Then July 1, 2024 is when all programs must be aligned to the new literacy standards and TPEs. SB 488 requires, requires us to certify that every multiple subject and education specialist program across the state meets the requirements of the new standards and TPEs. We do not know what that, we're still envisioning what that certification is gonna look like. It is going to be different than your annual accreditation. Um, and we're going to appreciate feedback from you all as we as we make uh, some ideas, share ideas with you of what we think that'll look like. Texas keeps coming back.
All right, so a couple of the decisions that the commission made were first of all, that all of the new PK3 specialist instruction credential programs will be aligned to the new standards and TPEs from the beginning. All new multiple subject and single, sub, uh, single subject and education specialist program proposals must be aligned with the new literacy standards and TPEs when they are submitted. So those are new programs. Again, the certification process, we're gonna be developing that over the course of the next year. We're gonna be eager to work with early adopters who think that they're ready um, so that we can try out what we think is a good way to do it. Uh, but we've already realized that the, the TPE matrix is not going to be enough. And one important thing that I need you all to start thinking about is that we are going to need experts in reading instruction to assist in the reviews. So please think about volunteering your time uh, to help us ensure that every program is meeting the new standards and TPEs. So pursuant to SB 488, the new literacy performance assessment must assess the competence in reading foundational in teaching foundational reading skills, aligned to the requirements of subparagraphs A and B of paragraph four of subdivision B of education code section 44259. What's interesting is those two paragraphs have been there for over 20 years. These are not new. And then the new, um, and then it also, in, uh, we must be consistent with uh, the current ELA ELD framework adopted by the state board. And then the new literacy performance assessment must meet the commission's assessment design standards for teaching performance assessments. Uh, until we have that literacy performance assessment, candidates are still gonna need to pass the RECA. So this was kind of a deal that was struck in order to move away from RECA, we're going to have a, a performance assessment on reading instruction. So the development of this performance assessment will start pretty soon. Uh, we're gonna identify and appoint a design team. They are going to draft literacy, literacy assessments with the design team and with our contractor. We're gonna to continue to develop those and conduct pilot tests for multiple subjects, single subject, education specialist, and the PK3 early childhood education specialist credential. We do not anticipate having one literacy performance assessment for all credentials. That's something we learned, I think, with the education specialist credential. So, these are gonna be, they'll have much of the same, but tuned a little bit to each credential. In 24-25, we'll continue the development uh, based on our pilot test findings, conduct a, conduct a field test, and then complete final revisions based on, that, on the field test findings. We'll also be conducting then a standard setting study in spring 2025 and present a proposal to the commission for initial passing scores. 2526 will be the first operational year of the new literacy performance assessment. And from then on, we'll be managing the ongoing uh, implementation of it. So as you've seen with the Cal TPA and the Cal APA, every year there's a little bit of changes where it's continuous improvement. So we're, as we look, what we learn each year, we try to improve the next year. All right, ethnic studies. So first thing we wanna share, and, and many of you may know this already, in our proposed regulations for subject matter, which were approved by the commission in June, uh, we added ethnic studies as an acceptable major as showing subject matter competence for the social subject, the social, single subject social studies uh, credential. These are currently with the Office of Administrative Law and hopefully we'll have a smooth process sailing through them. So this is not 
yet available. Uh, but as soon as we do get those regulations approved, we will be notifying you as soon as possible. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to review and update the subject matter requirements for history and social studies to include greater preparation and ethnic studies content. Uh, we'll start with the model curriculum that the uh, state board has provided, but we'll also be asking experts, uh, including you and K-12 teachers to help us with that content. And finally, we're gonna be exploring credential solutions for ethnic studies. There was a bill to make it a standalone credential that did not make it out of committee. So we're exploring what we can do on our own. And now I'm going to turn it over to Kara for grants. Good afternoon, friends in the field. So happy to be back. Sorry for those of you, this is a repeat from this morning, but I'm gonna go a little slower this time. So for those of you who didn't join me this morning or us this morning for the, policy, for the other information, I wanted to be very excited with you about new monies for institutions of higher education, woo woo. <laughs> and that comes in the way of integrated grants. Uh, several of you were integrated grant recipients back in 2016, and that money has long since been gone. And there's new and renewed um, focus on integrated grants. What did I do? Oh, look, there's a lot of me and that's never good. All right. <laughs> Ooh, can I just get rid of that? There we go. All right, I'm gonna move you to the side. I thought, ooh, they're saying ooh, and I didn't know what they were saying ooh about. All right, so back to integrated grants. So um, especially based on what you'll hear later, the PK3 new credential, you know, if, if you're an institution that is, that is working toward eventually um, applying to have a program that's the PK3 credential, maybe you want to explore some integrated grant opportunities around that. So there are two RFAs that if all goes well, will come out at the end of next week or at least the first week of November. The first RFA, they're coming out the same time. And one RFA will be for two, awards of $250,000 to create a new integrated grant program. So this is starting from the beginning, starting from basics. What are you all thinking? Work together, call in your community college friends and so on and work toward producing teachers in those high area needs, right? Those shortage fields, science, math, bilingual, special education, transitional kindergarten, and so on, okay? So planning grants, much like the original grant opportunity back in 2016. Then, wait, there's more. There will be another RFA. I'm not doing something. Click on the slide. Next. Okay, thanks. Thanks, guys. Uh, there's another RFA coming up for $500,000. And for those of you who have already had integrated programs, this particular pot of money is for those who would like to expand their current integrated program and or implement their current integrated program and or partner with that community college, partner is out in the field and have a robust integrated um, program of uh, leading to a credential in those shortage areas. So two RFAs coming out. There is one pot of money for these two RFAs and that is $20 million. So I did some math earlier and if let's say some programs join together and you go one, you go for one 250 and one for 500, that's 750,000 divided into 20 million is about 26 awards, okay? And you know, it's, everyone's not gonna be 750, but just letting you know, it will be a competitive um, application process. So do your best, have a robust, program, have a robust planning opportunity, and uh, we're looking forward to sending some, uh, some funds your way to institutions of higher education. Because as you well know, <laughs> there's been a lot of money going to LEAs to partner with you all, and we are seeing a lot of partnership coming through with our teacher residency programs. Uh, it was 
sort of interesting in the first round of uh, teacher residency funds from 2018 that the LEAs were all, let's go get this money. And then went to the IHEs and said, hey, we got this money. Okay, now we're seeing, we can tell from the way the uh, applications are written that our friends and the institutions of higher education are partners. <laughs> you all are talking together, you're part of the writing, uh, you've been very supportive and it's clear in the applications that there's been a shift. So we're excited about that. So uh, in 2021, just last year, we, uh, the commission was awarded $350 million to pass out to you all. Okay, and at this moment, we have um, had a round of capacity grants for teacher residency, and we've had a round of expansion grants for teacher residency. And of that 350 million, we have a good 200 and some odd million still left. Just last Friday, the implementation RFA closed. We had 43 applicants. So we're so excited and there's more money going out the door. Just last week, we also opened up the next round of teacher residency capacity. So that is open now. You can go to our website and check out that out. And um, capacity, I believe, is due November 18th. It's coming up. So there's a lot of opportunity to partner with your LEA friends um, around teacher residency. And, and we'll tell, I'll tell you, we're seeing it. Um, yeah. Moving right along. Um, oops, did I miss something? Oh, and then wait, there's more. So in the current budget year, um, 250 million was sent forward from the state of California and to, to pass out to you all also to add counseling residencies. How are your counseling residencies going? Yeah, we don't know about that exactly. So what the great news is, is just in one of the last budget bills, we were able to ask, to encourage our legislature to consider, can we use some of that money for capacity building around counseling residencies? Because it might take a conversation or two or three or a billion with your LEA friends and in your own organizations to talk about what is a counseling residency, what that might look like. So. There will be an RFA for counseling residency capacity building coming out, and there will be continued money potentially for counseling residencies and more teacher residencies. So keep, keep up the, the good work you all are doing out there. And last but not least, and I'll tell you the small but mighty teacher residency team at the commission, we're so over the moon thrilled with the 25, I'm sorry, the 20 million that was, um, determined to be, create a technical assistance center for teacher residency. So not that everyone is out there doing their own thing and, and not knowing where to go, but we can come together in one spot and be supported and really work together to the betterment of everybody around teacher residency. So we're thrilled. And that RFA should come out in the next month or so. We're very excited about that. All right. There's still classified grant money on the table. We had our round, our second round. Um, it's currently open. And by the way, you're hearing me say second round, first round. We're gonna keep putting out RFAs until all the money is gone, all right? Or until the year we have to you know, be done encumbering is gone. So we'll keep you all informed how much money's left, how many more rounds are we gonna do? But we're down to about, about half of the classified grant money. So there is a portion that LEAs need to talk to our IHE friends about undergraduate work and cred uh, credential programs and so on. So I'm sure you've been contacted by some of them, but yes, there is a current open RFA that's due in December and um, we'll see, we, classified is very popular and we'll see if we end up um, uh, awarding the last of the 125 million. Um, we also um, have the computer science supplementary authorization grant going. And um, of the 15 million that uh, was av available, we still have 14 million left. So we'll, we'll see, you know, we, we're keep pinning out RFAs and we'll, again, 
RFAs will come out until the money is gone because we don't want to keep it. We want to give it to you all and to our other friends in the field. And last but not least, when a new grant opportunity is the reading and literacy authorization incentive, it's modeled very much similar to the computer science one. It funds $2,500 to interested teachers with a matching funds of $2,500 um, to, to encourage them to get that supplementary or to get that added authorization uh, for literacy. Um, and, and looky here, you know, AB you know, 488 and all the literacy talk, and here we are, and here's an opportunity to, um, to add to our LEAs, uh, folks who are, um, you know, more, um, more, what's the word? I'm so tired. That are, are, are just, uh, you know, bringing to light literacy and being able to be supportive in the districts, better literacy teachers and help their peers be le better liter teachers of literacy. And so that's it for me. Please, you will have these uh, PowerPoint slides, as we said, and come visit us. We have all sorts of email boxes for you to contact us per grant opportunity. And you can always contact me and I will send you to the proper people. I appreciate your time today. And we're gonna hear about PK3 next. Thank you. So the development of the new PK3 Early Childhood Education Specialist Credential has been uh, based on a very broad partnership. And some of these partners are coming up to the stage right now to be part of a panel. Um, and we have our executive director, Mary Vixie Sandy, um, from the California Department of Education, Sarah Neville Morgan, Stephen Profiter, and Alana Pinsler, Deborah Stipek from Stanford, Kate Brown and Renee Marshall, Kate from the California Community College System, Renee recently of the California Community College System, but now a member of the PSD staff. We're being tech savvy here. We got to get the next computer going. So thanks everybody for your patience. Um, it is so exciting to be here today. My name is Renee Marshall, and I am proud to say I am the newest administrator with the California Commission on Teacher Credential. It, 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 it takes like 
Um, that is not our slide, even though it is very beautiful. Hello, everybody. Um, <laughs> but our slide is a wheel that shows all of those funding pieces and to be part of history in action. So right now we are in essence creating a new grade in California, which means that higher ed is going to Um, we, we, we think about like the, the, the need here. Um, we've known that in ECE, we, we've kind of had a, a struggle of having enough, uh, a large enough workforce to meet the needs. Um, and certainly as you have any kind of expansion, whether it's TK or, or anything else, you're gonna put strains on the, on the workforce. So as we think about the additional workforce needs we're gonna have, uh, to meet the demand of TK, we'll have a need of about just under 12,000 uh, to 15,000 or 15 and a half thousand uh, TK teachers, um, as well as 25 to 26,000 teaching assistants by 25, 26. And, and again, in a TK 12 system that is already struggling with, uh, with teacher and staff shortages across the state. So in when Sarah says we're, we're, we, we're kind of leaning in with you, that is exactly, we look at those numbers and we, we see the, the clear need. Um, let's see here. Trying to keep be mindful of our time here. Um, so the uh, we we know that uh, TK teachers um, and we as we think about state preschool, state preschool is also a place where we have need for for uh, support for teacher prep. Um, the different the uh, requirements for a TK teacher. Uh, you know, via, via credential versus a child development uh, permit for state preschool programs. There are some differences. And so we have kind of diversified needs within, uh, within our, our uh, teacher prep um, space. So um, the, the credential here, the PK3 credential will provide a, a bridge for our early childhood educators that have a bachelor's degree uh, as well as preschool experience to earn a uh, teacher teaching credential which is oh, highly needed with the expansion of uh, super disco Steven. in each grade. So one of the, the, the focal connections, one of these like critical pieces here is the PK3 ECE Specialist Instruction Credential, which is specifically designed uh, to, to meet the needs of, of this, the, the workforce. And now I'm gonna pass the, uh, the microphone over to, uh, to Mary. Thank you. 
Is this cracking you guys up? This is cracking me up. I think I just heard Jeff Duncan Andrade say, talk about, you know, you come in with a plan to any classroom and then you just kind of follow what the day brings. So thanks for your forbearance and thank you for your composure, colleagues up here. So um, I'm going to start the clicker, but it's not working. I'm, I'm so just, I, you know what? Good. I have given up on that part of, of what we're doing and it's all good. So we have about uh, 11 minutes and I'm going to take five of them uh, if you'll permit me. So uh, it is great to be doing this work uh, around universal transitional kindergarten and to have Sarah Noble Morgan and Stephen Profiter and Alanda Plinsler with us. And I also think Janana, Janina Perez was here, but she may have left already. Uh, this has been a major effort to get universal uh, transitional kindergarten in the context of UPK up and off the ground. And the chance to work together on this has been just just powerful uh, accelerator to what we're trying to do. So who can teach UTK classrooms? Currently, the only people who have an authorization to teach in a transitional kind kindergarten classroom are multiple subject credential holders. And a year from now, they must have 24 units of early childhood uh, education coursework in order to be eligible to teach legally a UTK classroom. They must have a grounding in child development. Uh, we are building and have built, actually our building has been my narrative for a long time, but we have built a pre-K through grade three teaching credential to address the needs of this, of universal transitional kindergarten. That, Credential itself draws from the work we've been doing uh, to build uh, teaching performance expectations around the, the child development permit, which is really used in our, in our state preschool system, but also drawing from our multiple subject credential standards. This is not a multiple subject credential and it's not a child development permit, but it overlaps with both of those things. Uh, so the, this credential holder will overlap in the authorization to teach preschool and will overlap with multiple subject in the authorization to teach through grade three. So building it, and if I hit this, if I hit the, okay, if you could take me a couple down, the pad, one this more, one? that'd be great, one more, that'd okay. be great. Perfect. Here are the requirements for earning uh, the permit, or the, excuse me, the new credential. Uh, first of all is a bachelor's degree, and this list looks an awful lot like what it, what's required for any teaching credential. You have to have a BA. The subject matter requirement for this credential is child development. This is very exciting. We're really going to get child development as a foundation for a teaching credential in California right now. And you can meet that through a BA in early childhood or child development studies, or through these 24 units that a multiple subject credential holder is required to get in order to be legally authorized to teach as of next year. Completion of a preparation program that recognizes the training and preparation you've already had, recognizes experience, and this is gonna be a little challenging, how you onload and, and admit and enroll and figure out the rest of the, the educational plan for some of these candidates may be a little challenging at first, but this is intended to allow for existing experience to, to be recognized towards the credential. A teaching performance assessment will be part of this uh, as well, uh, as we're reading uh, the RECA until we have the uh, literacy performance assessment, which by the way, our intention at this stage is to not create yet another performance assessment that sits alongside the others. It, our intention is to work on how we build it in to the performance assessments that we have. So the commission adopted this structure in August and they adopted standards for this credential uh, last week. <laughs> this is a very exciting moment for us. We're moving the regulatory process forward. Our expectation is that there will be, um, that programs can begin designing. They can begin writing for implementation grant or for, for planning grants for undergraduate integrated programs to help you do that. They, there's some other things that our next speakers are going to talk about that you ought to be thinking about. Uh, but we are ready to begin reviewing those programs as early as next spring and hope to begin to see early adopters as early as next year. It's going to take a couple years to get this fully implemented. We're at the beginning of a really important opportunity to establish a second to none class of teachers who can bridge the gap between preschool and grade three and really get that done. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Deb and <clears throat> Deborah Stipek from Stanford and Kate Brown from Skyline. Skyline Community College. <laughs> I'm still there. 
<laughs> also, I see people bringing up your phones and taking screenshots. We are happy to share the slide deck with everybody. Also, next time we're going to come with a QR code just to make it simple, you know, easier. All right, I'm uh, Deborah Stipek and uh, an emeritus faculty member from Stanford. And Kate and I have the opportunity to tell you what all this means for you, those of you who are in higher ed and especially in teacher education. The P3 credential will pose some challenges to you in developing these programs, but it also offers some exciting opportunities. So um, one of the challenges is that developing the plan and implementing the plan is going to require some cross uh, division, cross uh, uh, department, sometimes even cross school collaborations. The expertise, which is definitely needed in subject matter teaching is typically will be in this multiple subject program, which is typically in the Department of Education or the School of Education. The folks who have been preparing people giving them the courses that they need for the child development permit are most often in a different department, uh, in a different place in the university. I threw this together just as an illustration. It actually is one of the universities in California, just to show you where the expertise resides and the, the new kinds of collaborations that are going to be required. There will be, you will find that even when you look across your campuses at what, where the expertise is, there will be holes. There will be people who are teaching the math or literacy or science methods courses in the multiple subjects program who don't really have strong expertise in teaching children as young as four. The people who are teaching the child development courses may not have a lot of experience preparing people for practice. So that's where I think the opportunities come, opportunities for faculty to grow in their own expertise, and also we hope some opportunities for some new faculty positions where, where you are. Now, one thing about um, what you've heard is that it's really important that we attract a lot of people to this new credential. And also we want a diverse population of people who, re who reflect at least to some degree, the diverse population of children that they're going to be teaching. Kate's going to talk to you about some of the, the um, opportunities and challenges of implementing programs that achieve those goals. Thank you. This is the first time I've been here um, but I sure hope it isn't the last. Um, I am a professor of child development and early education at Skyline Community College, and there are 116 community colleges. And I think a really important point of this credential will be a bridge, not just for the children, the younger children of our state to be part of the public education system, but also the faculty that we can collaborate. So one of my important points is if we want great teachers who are, there's enough, so that there's enough of them, I sound like Stephen, so that they are connected in early childhood education and know how young children learn. Yeah. Uh, that sounds like Sarah. I think that it's really important that we look at the collaboration between two and four year colleges. So if you take that teacher and say, how is that teacher going to become competent and is going to also reflect the diversity of the children that we have in our state, walk, walk her toes, walk their toes over, and you'll see, oh, sorry, that's a building at Skyline. Um, that's a collaboration between the two-year and the four-year universities. Maybe your university doesn't look like that, but let's join up. Because if we collaborate between the four and two-year colleges, what we're doing now then is taking the expertise of teaching and preparing the early childhood workforce, which has been the workhorse of that workforce development has been the community colleges and connecting it with what you've been doing in developing credentials. At the same time, I think to attract a sufficient number and diverse um, teachers, we're going to need to make it possible to obtain the credential while you get your bachelor's degree. Lots of states do this, but we haven't. And in doing that, we have ended up with people either not coming into the field because women can do just about anything. And also that people don't wanna take on all of that debt when it takes so long to get a credential. So that's why the big X is there. So I want us to really be thinking 
in an innovative way about how we can develop these programs. Because if a person could start at the community college or even be a beginning student as a freshman and a sophomore and get some basics, foundations, they could then, they're then set to get their bachelor's degree and their credential at the same time. And because of that, I think that that means that as we do this together, lesson one will be to see how flexible and diverse we can be in not only preparing our teachers, but in offering the coursework that it will take and the clinical practice that it will take in both sides of the bridge. Thank you. I also wanna to mention too that a lot of our community colleges have dual enrollment programs where we have high school students who are identified as wanting to be future teachers. I know this because my daughter started the education pathway when she was in ninth grade at 13 years old in my area. So we've got kids who wanna be educators. So let's think about really how can we all be working together and partnering as much as possible. And if anybody needs help connecting, reach out to us. That's what we want to be helping with, you know, in, in one of the many spaces. But another thing I wanna to say too, and Kate mentioned the funding piece. As somebody who went to college and had to take out $100,000 for my education, let's talk funding. And I'm saying that because I'm guessing there's a lot of us in this room that are in the same boat as me. You had to take out a lot in order for those opportunities and or order for those pathways to continue and those doors to open up. But here's the great piece. And I know we've already been talking a little bit about funding today, but we've got the teacher residency grant program. We were just speaking about that classified school employee program. We have a lot of people who are on our campuses who have a ton of experience. Many of them already have bachelor's degrees or have degrees. We need to be tapping into those people and talking to them. We also have people who are working with us that have degrees from other countries. We need to figure out how they can be employable at higher levels and with additional opportunities in our education system. The last thing I wanna plug for funding, the Golden State Teacher Grant Program. That is a wonderful resource for anybody who does have to take out any loans during their process of becoming a teacher. And it's something that's really important for all of us to know. Um, we have some resources here, as we said, we'll share the deck with everybody. These are all live links. I also wanna say a couple quick plugs too. This is, First of two sessions, later on today at 5.30 to 6.30, we'll be talking more about this topic. We're sharing this space with another group that's gonna be talking about anti-racist education and what that looks like, but we hope that you join us at that time. I also wanna give a plug too, because our colleagues over at Learning Policy Institute tomorrow at 1.30 to 2.45 in the La Jolla room are gonna give a session on universal preschool expansion. What should teacher preparation programs do about it? This is the beginning of a conversation, everybody, and we're looking forward to creating listening spaces where we can hear exactly what the field needs and we can work together across systems to deeply impact the children and families and teachers of California. That's like as good as it gets, right? Let's make impact, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of the day. I do not think we have time for Q&A right now. We'll be outside. We'll be outside for Q&A for anybody who's interested. So thanks so much, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of the conference. We're here. Oh, yeah. Hi, y'all. So um, we realized that we expected you to just like poof up here in one place and then go to another, which works for the folks that kind of works for the folks who are here um, at 415, but doesn't work for everybody else. So we're going to build in a break right now, but that's going to shift our schedule. So the Concurrent research session number one will begin at 4.30 and go until 5.30. And then concurrent research session two will go from 5.45 to, to 6.45. And then we will have the president's reception out here beginning at 6.45. And that'll go from 6.45 till around 8, 6, 7.45. So folks who are coming will have light hors d'oeuvres and, and wine out here, okay? So 5, 4.30 to 5.30 now, 
5.45 to 6.45 for the second session. And then the arts, the um, arts integration workshop will be starting shortly just in Point Loma 3. So if you're, we're here Point Loma 2, you'll see where the other sessions are. But you have a little break until 4.30, okay? Thank you.